So the UFC's somewhat forgettable 2017 campaign comes to an end tonight, and wouldn't you know it, it ends on a high note. It ends with Chris Cyborg defeating Holly Holm, retaining her UFC women's featherweight title in the main event of UFC 219 here at the T-Mobile Arena. And one of the better fights of the year, it was a close one, and maybe even a little closer than we all thought. We'll talk about that in a second. Hello again, everyone. It's late here on Saturday night, about to become December 31st of 2017. One more day left of the year. I'm Ariel Hawani. That is Sean Alshadi. This is the MMAfighting.com post-fight wrap-up. And Sean, it was a great main event. I thought it was actually one of the better fights of 2017. I enjoyed it very much. Let's start with your scorecard, and then I'll ask you about the judges' scorecards. How did you score the main event between Chris Cyborg and Holly Holm? So I had it 4-1. to one. Um, I gave Chris every round except the second. I gave the second to Holly. Um, you know, there were a few close rounds in there, but I feel pretty comfortable with the 4-1 to score. It reminds me of John Jones versus Daniel Cormier 1, UFC 182, in that I agree with the 4-1 to scorecard, but that doesn't really tell the story. Yeah. It was a close 4-1, to right? Yeah, 4-1 to one is representative, I feel, of how actually close that fight was. It was a pretty back-and-forth fight for the most part. So you gave Chris the first... Yes. Holly the second, then three, four, and five to Chris. Now, interestingly enough, two of the judges gave Holly Holm the first two, yeah. and then Chris three and four, meaning it was tied on both of their scorecards going into the fifth. What do you make of that? I don't think people realize how close we were to Holly Holm winning a split decision there. I mean, it was tied going into that fifth round. If she does a little more in that fifth round, she comes out as the new featherweight champion, and this is a completely different we're talking about very different things right now. I thought Holly fought with a lot of heart. I mean, she's not a natural 145er, and I know the broadcast team was trying to sort of push that narrative after the fact. I thought it was one of, if not the most competitive fights yeah. of Chris Cyborg's career. And, and, and by the way, she said at the post-fight press conference, first time that she suffered a bloody nose in a fight, which is a great distinction, a great feather in Holly Holmes' cap. Let me ask you about Holly's performance first. Do you think she fought the right kind of fight? I mean, yes, she lost, but do you think she did as best as she possibly could? Yeah, I would say so. And, you know, one thing I was, I was very surprised about her strength kind of in the clinch situations, especially in the early rounds. I thought that was the one area where Chris would really be able to muscle her. I mean, Chris is so much bigger than Holly. Holly doesn't really have to cut to, do, to make 145. Chris cuts from, you know, 170, 180. But Holly really was seemed like she was strong in there. She was, she was doing well in the clinch situations with Chris. But overall, yeah, Chris just had the, the power and I think the size and just she kind of it was a snowball rolling down a hill. She figured Holly out a little bit as the fight went on and sort of overwhelmed her. I thought it was a patient Chris Cyborg, yeah. a technical Chris Cyborg. She fought a great fight. And just because it's the first five round fight of her career and, be, you know, she got the bloody nose, all that stuff doesn't take anything away from her. I thought this was one of her better performances. In fact, I thought it was one. I mean, you can make the case it was a better performance than Maybe, maybe a more complete performance than some of her other UFC fights. What did you make of her, her fight? Yeah, I would say so, and especially just because Holly is a very difficult stylistic challenge for Chris. That is something we all said going into it, and I think it kind of played out how a lot of people you know, expected. Uh, but you know, all credit to both women. That was a really fun fight. Cyborg walked out. I mean, I feel like I've said this enough at this point, and, and maybe she turns the corner now that she signed this new deal with the UFC and they're kind of going in on her. I feel like she has that superstar aura. Like she came out with the, the gold chain yeah. and the look, and she's talking, and, and you know, Mike Tyson's there and he's watching her. I feel like she can really do a lot of big business for the UFC, and we'll see how this pay per view does. First time she headlines a pay per view for the UFC. And yes, there's always that problem, you know, with, with competition. I'll ask you about competition in a second. But do you sense that, you know, here we are 10 years into her dominant run, that she can still be a moneymaker, that she could be, you know, one of the top stars, one of the top draws for the company? You know, that's an interesting question because I think she... If you think about it, she should be able to just because of sort of her credentials and, and her status as this very imposing uh, figure within the sport. But I mean, you have to go back to the competition because ultimately Holly Holm was probably the, the most popular fighter they'll be able to get to give her. Mm. Um, I don't know who, who else sort of they have it waiting in the wings that, that would be able to draw sort of the, the interest, at least the mainstream interest that Holly would just because of what Holly's done already and especially, you know, her fight against Ronda. I mean, Amanda Nunes is there. 
Megan Anderson is there. I, I don't know if many people outside of the hardcore fan base know Megan Anderson. Uh, that's a fight I would like to see, but I don't know that that would be a very you know popular fight. Whereas Amanda Nunes, it, it still feels like she hasn't really caught on sort of with that mainstream. So I don't know that Chris will be able to get that 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 foe that will that will draw sort of the interest that this one seemed to be. And it's still very confusing as to what the UFC wants to do with that division. Yeah. They still haven't signed anyone other than Megan Anderson and Chris Cyborg, like true 145ers. Uh, they don't have rankings. I mean, th there's there's no investment in it. Afterwards, Chris said she'd like to fight Megan Anderson in Australia, but remains to be seen if Megan can fight. She's been very quiet as to why she can fight. We know it's not an injury. It's something personal that she's dealing with. However, afterwards, on Twitter, she was calling for the fight. I feel like if I'm Megan Anderson's team, yeah, that's a big time fight, but I just don't know after a year plus layoff if that's the smartest move for her. Do you think that it would be a little premature to have her fight someone like Chris Cyborg if all of the personal stuff is resolved? Sure, I mean, that's a that's a tough fight to jump into if you haven't been inside of a cage for, for a year in a pro competition setting. Um, but I, again, I just don't know what other options there are. I mean, Amanda News would be, would be an interesting fight, and that's something you could market as a champion, champion versus champion fight. But yeah, it's pretty bleak out there when you just try to look at the ranks of 145. It really seems like we're just going to kind of see, you know, these 135 contenders, if you want to just come up and get a title fight right away in a main event, come fight Cyborg. It seems kind of the trend that we're going to have to go down. The only other option that she seems to have, and you mentioned it, Amanda Nunes. Yeah. Chris has often said that she does not like the idea of fighting a fellow Brazilian. However, if you look at the bantamweight division, there's not a lot of options right now for Nunes. The only one, Raquel Pennington, coming off that leg injury, she had an accident, and we don't know when she'll be back. Yeah. UFC was interested in making that fight, but, you know, the clock is ticking. Do you like that fight, and would you do it at 145? Would you have the bantamweight champ go up to 145 and try to become a dual champ? Honestly, I, I like that fight. Uh, I, I, if, but with the options that we have currently available to us, I think that would probably be the best fight in my opinion for Chris. Um, again, I don't think Megan Anderson has really gained sort of that following yet. And, and again, like we said, it, coming in a one year layoff off, you know, to fight someone like Cyborg, that is a tough ask. So Amanda Nunes would be my choice, but it, it, it's just, it's not looking like there's many other options, frankly. Right. So Chris Cyborg retains her featherweight title in the main event. Great yeah. performance, one of the better fights of the year. But if you ask me, like, what was the real story of UFC 219, it was the successful return of Khabib Nurmagomedov. Now 25-0, and 0, a thorough beatdown. I mean, an absolute... Uh, what, what, yeah, I mean, this was just one of the more one-sided fights. As far as, like, high-level MMA is concerned, I believe we had a 30-24 to 24 in there, which is just somewhat shocking when you're considering just how good Edson Barbosa is. Uh, if you were worried that uh, Khabib would have lost a step due to the injuries and the time off, I mean, he may have just proven that he is, in fact, the very best lightweight in the world, the, the very best fighter without a title right now. What did you make of his performance against Edson Barbosa, that unanimous decision win? It was something else, man. That was frightening. Uh, it, it was interesting, too, the way it played out, because the very maybe first 90 seconds, Bar Edson Barboza was really able to keep him at, at bay and sort of, you know, pick at him with strikes and, and land successfully. But, man, like about three, three and a half, or three and a half minutes left in the fight, Khabib finally got him down, and by the end of that round, it looked like Edson had gone through a five-round war. Like, the change in his face from about 3.30 to, to the end of the first is just crazy, and, and the exhaustion that was on him. It, it, Khabib's grappling, I don't know that I've ever seen a grappler like him in MMA. It's just, it's scary. I, I used that word already, but it's it's frightening watching what he does to these people, to these guys who are just, you know, world-class 140 or 155 pounders. He said afterwards that he could have finished the fight earlier, but he wanted to go the full 15, and I think a lot of people believe him. He also talked about how he was talking to Dana White again in the middle of the fight. He is just oozing confidence right now, and again, I, I feel like he could be the UFC's Triple G. He kind of speaks like him, he, he has a following like him, you know, comes from Dagestan, comes from Russia, which is obviously not Kazakhstan, but close. I mean, there's just something about him that reminds me of Triple G. Yeah. Now, the difference is, though, Triple G finishes a lot of people, at least as he was, you know, rising up the ladder. Do you think Khabib needs to start finishing these fights? Like, this game of, you know, letting fights go the distance, is that almost hurting him at this point? I don't know. I mean, I was, I don't feel like anybody 
is taken away from what he did tonight, right? Like that was just incredibly, incredibly impressive. No matter how, which way you you, you, you look at it, um, maybe. But I, I think what's holding him back the most is just sort of this questionable state of the lightweight division, and no one really knowing who's the real champion, what what's the next fight for him. Like everything is so murky, and we're we're all just kind of everything's at a standstill. That you you don't want to take away from what happened tonight, but it's just it's difficult to look forward because you just don't know what is forward for him. Uh, the other thing that may be holding him back, of course, is his inactivity. Yeah. He did say that he wants to fight in April slash May before Ramadan, then after Ramadan in September, and then one more time in December. That would be incredible for him, somewhat yeah. unprecedented in his UFC career to fight three times in 2018. I think that if he's successful in doing that and then wins all those fights, he could really become a superstar. But let's talk about the issue that you brought up. What is next for this man? He is completely ignoring Conor McGregor. He doesn't want to talk about him. He doesn't think he's coming back. He really wants wants to fight Tony Ferguson. Tony is the interim champion. If you're able to play, you know, UFC matchmaker and you have all the pieces available to you, what do you do with Khabib Nurmagomedov? I, I just feel like it would be tremendously unfair to make Tony Ferguson defend his interim title when the champion of the division is healthy. It makes no sense. If you're going to do that and you're going to, you want Khabib to fight Tony and you want Tony to fight Khabib, you have to strip Conor. At this point, like, there, what are we waiting on? Because that's the fight to make. That's the fight we all wanted to see at UFC 209. And I remember how thoroughly disappointed we were when we didn't get it. And I'd still love to see that fight, but it just doesn't make sense right now. If Because, again, the champion is healthy. And, and this is a, a champion who's only fought one, If I mean, I guess two if you count Nate Diaz. Actual fighters at 155, like, it, this needs to be settled. And we can't wait until, you know, the summer if Conor might fight in the summer. That just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, the UFC needs big fights. They need headliners. So if you're the commissioner of the UFC, you're stripping Conor and you're making that fight for the official title. If Conor isn't willing to fight, you know, first quarter or at least early second quarter of 2018 and defend that title, if I'm the commissioner of the UFC, absolutely I'm stripping that title and then I'm making Tony Khabib, which is a big fight. And you know what? Conor's big enough now. He doesn't need the belt. Sure. If Whenever he comes back, it's going to be huge regardless. And say, he, say Tony and Khabib, you know, fight for the real title and then Conor wants to come back and fight the winner of that. At that point, that'd be massive because those two would, would kind of push each other to be bigger, whoever the winner of that fight would be. Gun your head right now. Who do you pick, Khabib or Tony? I mean, I'm not jumping off the Tony bandwagon. I still f believe he's the best lightweight in the world, but I feel they are so close. If they fought 10 times, it might be 5-5. Five and five. Khabib, Connor, who do you pick? I would take Khabib. Wow. Okay. That easy of a fight? That dominant? I don't know that it would be easy. I mean, okay. we saw it tonight. Even, you know, uh, Khabib took some shots from Edson. Connor just does seem to have this power in his hands that, that not a lot of people do, but I think Khabib would beat him more often than not. And by the way, what a day for the Nurmagomedov family. Earlier yeah. today we found out that uh, his wife gave birth to a baby boy, a healthy baby boy back home in Dagestan. This is, in fact, their second child. He has a daughter. Uh, I know I saw <laughs> when I tweeted this out, a lot of fans said not only did they not know he was married, they didn't know he had a kid already. And I think this really speaks to Khabib's sort of mystique, yeah. if you will. Uh, he is not a very public person. He doesn't put his private life out there. And I think that's somewhat admirable. And, and he took a shot at Connor saying, you know, like when he was expecting a child, you know, he, he let the whole world know and it was this whole big countdown. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, everyone yeah. deals with it in their own way. But I do think like even this week, not even mentioning it, and for him to become a father now to, you know, a, a baby of, of yeah. the day of is, is an incredible story, right? It really is. And I think this sort of goes to sort of the mystical uh, aura that, that seems to surround Khabib, especially the more we see fights like this in the Michael Johnson fight. It was a guy who, who came into the UFC and no one really knew him and he's wearing, you know, the hat and, and we just hear about how he's wrestling bears and it seemed like this sort of, uh, he's, you know, he's undefeated, he has this crazy undefeated record and then he just starts mauling people. It just, it, it sort of builds into this, this sort of, again, some mystical element around him, which makes him feel bigger. Like tonight, when, he, when his fight was about to start, it felt like a big moment. It felt like a big fight and I feel like the same was could be said for UFC 205. We just don't get it enough, yeah. which is very, which is very unfortunate. I really hope we can get him three times next year because I, I believe if we do that, regardless of whether he wins or loses, he's going to be a big figure for the UFC by the end of 2018. Now, let me ask you about a couple other results. Uh, a little bit of a slow night, even though yeah. there are just ten fights on this card. There was some, I don't know, some 
some fights that really left a lot to be desired and uh, maybe one of those was the Neil Magny versus Carlos Condit fight. I think a lot of fans were very excited for the return of Carlos Condit and he ends up losing via unanimous decision to Neil Magny. It wasn't the Carlos Condit of old. Are you surprised by his performance or should we not be surprised considering the fact that he essentially walked away from the sport and then all of a sudden came back? Last fight was back in August of 2016. This isn't uncommon. Someone comes uh, back after a layoff, after a retirement and just isn't themselves, is rusty, is afraid to pull the trigger. What did you make of his performance? See, I, I don't I don't feel like he was afraid to pull the trigger. It was almost as if th though he just never got out of first gear. And I feel like it, it, it was... a in retrospect, it's easy to say in retrospect, obviously, but Neil Magny was a hard style matchup for him. I mean, it's just a tall guy who's, who's actually a little bigger than Carlos. I mean, how often has Carlos fought a bigger welterweight than him? Is it a grinder who has excellent cardio? It, again, in retrospect, it's a tough matchup for Carlos. And he just never felt like he, he sensed an element of danger and kind of ignited that NBK part of him, you know, that, that sort of bloodthirsty part of him. It almost felt like a sparring match. It was, it was a slow fight. That being said, I don't I don't feel like this is some sort of referendum on where Carlos is. I, I would I still feel like he has you know some fight left in him. He's still young. Obviously, you know, fight age is a little different than real age. Uh, but this wasn't like he went out there and got knocked out brutally or anything like that. I, I I would like to see him sort of get back into it and continue to fight. Hopefully. So you want to see him keep going? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, I, I saw a lot of tweets from people saying that they had enough. Why do you want to see him continue to fight? Because I, I, again, I don't. It's not like he got beaten badly. Like yeah. it was, it, it was a very point fight, and, and, and I don't know. I, I just get the sense that he's going to come away from this more frustrated than anything, and want to get back into it. Hopefully, a weird trend has developed over the last couple of years, especially with younger fighters and and with a few female fighters, where it seems like when the UFC really starts to push someone and pinpoint that this is going to be a star for them, they falter, and. Tonight, Cynthia Calvillo lost to Carla Esparza. Now, losing to Carla Esparza is, is, yeah. is nothing to scoff at. This is the first ever UFC strawweight champion, still a very uh, talented fighter, a contender. Although, they did really get behind Cynthia Calvillo as a late. I think we talked about that on the preview show. Reebok commercial, body armor sponsorship deal. Was this a big step back for Cynthia Calvillo? What did you make of her performance? Is this one that she's able to get back on the horse and not really lose a step if she's victorious in her next fight? Yeah, you know, I, I see a lot of people talking about this idea of when a UFC gets behind a fighter, often they seem to struggle, but how often do we see these undefeated rises in this sport? Like, everybody loses. Mm. To expect someone to, that's, that's on, honestly what makes someone like a Francis Ngannou or even Connor during his rise more special is someone who's able to navigate that path without suffering that defeat or that letdown, because this is a game where everybody, everybody suffers it eventually, everybody loses. It's one little moment and can change everything. I don't think she loses much from this. I mean, Carla Esparza, whether people that like it or not, is a world-class fighter who, who was a former champion in the UFC. Like, she's no can to anybody. A loss to her is not any, any you know, big scar or mark on your resume. Uh, Cynthia ultimately had a successful year. At the beginning of this year, nobody knew anything about her, and we didn't know who she was. She beat four women that are in the UFC, County and Mon uh, Montana De La Rosa, who's now in the UFC. Four and one over the course of her first year, really, as a, as a you know mainstream pro fighter, that's not a bad thing to, to look at, you know. Dan Hooker with a win over Mark J. Casey, uh, Tim Elliott, uh, who had a heavy heart, was very emotional afterwards yeah. uh, after his win over Mark De La Rosa, um, coming off the passing of his coach and mentor Robert Fallis. He had a nice performance, yeah. got a bonus as well. Miles Jury with another nice performance at 145, a win over Rick Land. Any other performance you want to talk about before we say goodnight? No, I think you kind of hit the big ones. Sorry about um, that. Hey, it happens. <laughs> it was a 10 fight card. You, you right, name, yeah. We talked about like seven fights. Uh, but, you know, it, what, Tim Elliott was a big one. I, I feel like this was a, a big one for him. Um, we've talked about, you know, what, it, what all this meant to him. And then to get a performance bonus, especially after kind of the frustration he experienced in Winnipeg with his, with, you know, his, his money situation, it, that's at least something to feel good about walking away from this. 30 to 40 years from now, you're sitting at home, you're in Arizona, you're enjoying a drink, uh, maybe a hot chocolate, and your grandkids come up to you and say, Grandpa Sean, what was 2017 like in MMA? How would you describe this year? Meh. It was just a down year. I don't know. It, 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 I feel like tonight was honestly pretty representative of, of what this year was. It was a car that was very slow. 
Uh, and until the last few fights, it didn't really pick up. And, and I, I feel like this year never really got off the ground other than the weird couple months long circus that was Maymac. We never really felt like any sort of big feel, a big fight feel uh, throughout the year. And, you know, hopefully that changes in 2018. But that, just honestly, it, it was a down year. UFC 217 in New York had that feeling, but it kind of like came and went. And then George relinquished <laughs> the belt. So it felt like that afterglow didn't yeah. last very long. Do you see 2018 picking up? Like, with the fights announced thus far, with the cards announced thus far, of course we had the press conference yesterday for 220. Do you see them turning the corner, or do you feel like it will be more of the same? I, th I mean, with what they already have lined up, 220 is very good. I mean, the, the, the top two fights. It's very top heavy, though. I mean, did you see that pay-per-view card? It's not, you know, it's, sure. a, it's not sure. a heavy hitter crew. Sure, but Steve Bay versus yes. Francis is yes. the, a heavyweight fight that I, that's more anticipated for me than any heavyweight fight since maybe the Kane uh, versus JDS beginning of that trilogy. Um, and then, you know, you move right into Robert Whitaker and Luke Rockhold. It's nice to have these divisions starting to roll again, and guys are fighting the people they should. If that's a trend that continues into 2018, I'm all for it. And, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll get Connor back and we can do Connor versus Tony or Ta Connor versus Khabib and we can start that division up again. There's options out there. There's a p possibility for 2018 to be a bounce back. And, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist. I hope that happens. There are questions galore that need to be answered in 2018 for the UFC. The big one, of course, where will their new TV home be? Yeah. We'll find out around this time next year. We'll find out if they leave Fox, if they re-sign with Fox, if they go on multiple networks. That's a big one to watch in 2018. We'll have plenty of time to talk about that next year. For now, it's time to say goodbye to 2017. And it has been an absolute privilege to cover this great sport for all of you. Thank you so much for coming back each and every day, each and every week, even though this may not have been like last year, even though the fights weren't as great as last year. There were plenty of great stories, plenty of great uh, fights, interviews, things of that nature, and we um, wholeheartedly appreciate you guys coming back day after day. I think I speak for the entire yeah. site when I say that, the entire staff as well. So thank you once again. We'll see you in 2018. And oh, by the way, we're off on Monday because it is January 1st, but the MMA Hour is back on Tuesday for one of my favorite episodes of the year. It's our 2017 MMA Hour Award Show. Can't wait for it. 20 categories, the most comprehensive award show in the entire sport, from Fighter of the Year to walk out of the year to feel good moment of the year and everything in between can't wait for that so stay tuned monday at, excuse me tuesday i'm used to saying monday tuesday at 1 p.m eastern on mmafighting.com for now we will say goodbye have a great new year uh, only the best everyone in 2018 we look forward to many great fights next year thank you for watching once again not only tonight but all year long good night from las vegas